Welcome to this program in the Our Finger Lakes History Series. I am Seneca County historian Walter Gable. Since March is Women's History Month, I want to share with you as this program a nuts and bolts history of the first Women's Rights Convention held in Seneca Falls in July 1848. Seneca Falls and the First Women's Rights Convention has been very much in the news these past several years. President Obama, in his second inaugural address in January 2013, specifically mentioned Seneca Falls, along with Selma and Stonewall, as places of significant developments in the effort to make all of us free and equal in rights. As the Seneca County historian, I have, I have been asked several times, why did this first woman's rights convention take place in Seneca Falls rather than somewhere else? I have spent a lot of time reading and researching and pondering an answer to the question, why Seneca Falls? I think the answer is that it was the intermingling of the factors that are shown in this slide that go a long way towards explaining why Seneca Falls. In 1848, Seneca Falls was on the major transportation routes. More specifically, all trains going west from Albany to Buffalo and places still further west went through Seneca Falls. Also, the Cayuga Seneca Canal was connected to the Erie Canal in 1828, providing a cheap and efficient and therefore tremendous movement of goods produced in the Finger Lakes region, including manufactured goods in Seneca Falls industries and agricultural products in the area. People were moving to Seneca Falls and neighboring Waterloo. Many of these people were to become simply factory workers, but there were several businessmen and lawyers, people of the upper class. These people brought ideas with them when they moved from Philadelphia, Boston, and so on to Seneca Falls. Seneca Falls was very much caught up in the many reform movements that were taking place in upstate New York at this time. I will have more specifics to say about this a little later in the program. Of course, you cannot discount the importance of several key individuals and groups that I will also be talking about. One of the major factors is this Second Great Awakening of the 1820s, 1830s, and 1840s. It was a major religious revival movement started by the Reverend Charles Grandison Finney, who is the key preacher. He is shown uh, in this slide. Western New York was a hotbed of this Second Great Awakening. So much religious revivalism took place in this area that it became known as the Burned Over District. The religious revivalism of this burned-over district led to an outpouring of religious and societal reforms. A major reform movement was that of temperance, and Seneca Falls was very much a part of this reform. The Washingtonians talked about total abstinence from alcohol, and the local Seneca Falls Washingtonians produced for a brief time a newspaper appropriately named The Water Bucket. There were many local temperance societies in addition to the Washingtonians. One of these local societies was the Ladies' Total Abstinence Society, which had its publication known as The Lily. Amelia Jenks Bloomer became the sole editor of The Lily, so she is recognized as the first female newspaper editor in the United States. You will note that the masthead of The Lily says that this is a monthly journal devoted to temperance and literature. 
Elizabeth Cady Stanton wrote several articles for the Lily using the pen name Sunflower. Elizabeth Cady Stanton will encourage Bloomer to advocate women's rights concerns in the Lily. Anti-slavery activism was perhaps the major reform movement coming out of the Second Great Awakening, and Seneca Falls was very much a hotbed of Underground Railroad activity. Now, when I'm using the term Underground Railroad, I am using the term in its broadest sense to refer to any kind of anti-slavery activity. In Seneca Falls at the Methodist Church in late October 1837, the Seneca County Anti-Slavery Society was organized. There were many anti-slavery societies, including an American Anti-Slavery Society, a Western New York Anti-Slavery Society, and so on. In 1844, several anti-slavery businessmen in Seneca Falls finally opened the Seneca Woolen Mills as an alternative to slave-grown cotton mills. At the bottom of this slide, you will see a notice for an October 1843 anti-slavery fair. Although it wasn't specifically mentioned, everyone in town knew that the phrase, to help the cause along, meant that the proceeds from this anti-slavery fair would be used to help pay fares for freedom seekers, or fugitive slaves as they were known then, to leave Seneca Falls on the train to get to Canada, where slaves had all, slavery had already been abolished. Many historians point out that there might very well not have been a woman's rights movement prior to the Civil War had there not been this anti-slavery movement. They say that for two basic reasons. One, the involvement of women in the anti-slavery movement raised their consciousness of how women were being treated inferior to men. Secondly, the involvement of women in the anti-slavery movement enabled them to learn important leadership skills, such as how to organize, advertise, and conduct meetings. Another form of anti-slavery activism in Seneca Falls were the numerous meetings of the Free Soil Party members throughout the summer of 1848, the same summer as the Women's Rights Convention. These free soilers were determined to not let any of the territories that the United States received from Mexico in the Mexican War, the so-called Mexican Session, they did not want any of that territory to become slave states. Some of the names that appear with this newspaper notice are names of some of the most prominent businessmen in the area, such as J.P. Jacob Chamberlain, J.P. Cowing, among others. The first Women's Rights Convention took place at the Wesleyan Chapel in Seneca Falls. In 1834, 1843, like many communities throughout upstate New York, there were many members of Protestant church congregations that were upset with their church, upset that their church was not taking a strong enough stand against slavery. Many of these Protestants with these strong anti-slavery sentiments left their congregation and organized new congregations. These new congregations became known uh, as come-outer churches, and there were over 240 of them established in upstate New York as a result of the Second Great Awakening. And many of these come-outer churches were actually Wesleyan Methodist congregations. The Wesleyan Methodists in Seneca Falls quickly set about building a new meeting place, which became known as the Wesleyan Chapel. 
It was built on the western edge of what was then the business district of Fall Street in Seneca Falls. The Wesleyan Methodist congregation in Seneca Falls, like all Wesleyan Methodist congregations, was fully anti-slavery, and it welcomed both whites and blacks as members and even as church trustees. Several of the pastors of the Wesleyan Methodist Church in Seneca Falls used the congregation's parsonage and probably even the chapel itself as stations or safe houses on the Underground Railroad. Pastor Reverend George Pegler got a freedom seeker by the name of Peter Bannister to speak here in the chapel in November 1844 and tell of how he had been mistreated as a slave. The significance of that speech cannot be understated. That is a most unusual event to have a black slave talk before an all-white audience, just something that wasn't done. In southern plantations, the black slave would never speak to a white unless the white spoke first to the black. Now, the Wesleyan Chapel was frequently used by different reform groups as meeting places. So far, I have shown some some of the temperance and anti-slavery activity taking place in Seneca Falls, especially in the 1840s. There were many other reform movements. One of those was Amelia Jenks Bloomer, who in the Lily popularized a new outfit for women to wear public, the outfit that became known as the Bloomer outfit, and it was much more comfortable and practical than the hoop skirts and the many petticoats that women of the time typically had to wear. Another area of reform was prison reform, and that was developed at the state prison in nearby Auburn, where, worker, where the prisoners always ate in silence, marched to and fro in silence, but were expected to do some kind of uh, work that would be a profitable activity. Out of the Second Great Awakening, also, there arose some new religious movements. One of those was the organization of a brand new church by Joseph Smith, Jr., and that is the Latter-day Saints Church. That took place at the Peter Whitmer Farm in neighboring town of Fayette to Seneca Falls in 1830. Within the Society of Friends, or the Quaker Church, there were divisions, there were differences of opinion over how much to push for social reform. Thomas McClintock of nearby Waterloo was instrumental in the development of the new Quaker faction that became known as the Progressive or Congregational Friends. I like to liken the Rhoda Beeman trial of, in the Seneca Falls Presbyterian Church as a precursor of the 1848 Women's Rights Convention. Rhoda Beeman and Elizabeth McClintock signed their names to that October 1843 annual, an, excuse me, anti-slavery fair notice that is shown. For two consecutive Sundays, Rhoda Beeman had given the notice of the fair to the pastor, Reverend Bogue of the Presbyterian Church, for him to read from the pulpit as part of his weekly announcements to those attending Sunday morning worship services. But the Reverend Bogue, for two consecutive Sundays, did not read the notice. So Rhoda Beeman confronted Reverend Vogue to get an explanation as to why he did not read the notice. A shouting match ensued. Reverend Bogue insisted that the church session put Rhoda Beeman on trial for her unchristian conduct. In the trial, Rhoda Beeman issues, in the trial of Rhoda Beeman, issues were raised dealing with temperance, anti-slavery, as well as women's rights concerns. 
The church session found Rhoda Beeman guilty of her unchristian conduct, and she, because she would not confess her wrongs or change her ways, she left the church. When Rhoda Beeman started attending the newly formed Wesleyan Methodist services, the Presbyterian Church session expelled her as a member. Several of Rhoda Beeman's supporters then joined the Wesleyan Methodist Church congregation. But we can see that this intermingling of temperance, anti-slavery, as well as women's rights issues is a great precursor of the 1848 Women's Rights Convention. Now, there is one more historical event that I still have to cover as background leading to the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848. That event is the World Anti-Slavery Convention that was held in London in 1840. Delegates from the various anti-slavery societies in the United States went to London, as well as delegates from different countries in Europe. Henry Brewster Stanton was a delegate to this World Anti-Slavery Convention. Henry and his new bride, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, were using this London convention as an extended honeymoon trip to Europe. Lucretia Mott was a delegate from a female anti-slavery society, but at the convention, a majority of the delegates voted that they would not seat any female delegates from United States anti-slavery societies. So Lucretia Ma was not seated as a delegate simply because she was a female. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Ma became good friends at this convention, and they vowed to do something about the condition of women when they both got back to the United States. They, however, will not meet each other until July 9th of 1848. Jane Master Hunt, wife of Richard P. Hunt, invited Elizabeth Cady Stanton to come to her home because Lucretia Mott and her sister Martha Coffin Wright of Auburn would be there, as well as Mary Ann McClintock. Now, I'm using the date July 9th, and that becomes very important because several sources will incorrectly use the date of July 13th, and I'll explain why that's a mistake in a moment. But first of all, I want to show you the pictures of the five ladies. These are the five ladies that decided when they got together at Jane Masters Hunt home on Sunday, July 9th, that they would call a women's rights convention. Now, all but Elizabeth Cady Stanton are Quakers. Elizabeth Cady Stanton has moved to Seneca Falls in 1847 with her family. She has very quickly entered into feelings almost of depression that she felt that Seneca Falls, in terms of social life, was much more isolated than was the active social life that she enjoyed while they were living in Boston. She starts at this gathering on July 9, 1848, to talk about how she finds this isolated existence in Seneca Falls, that motherhood is not enough, and very quickly, with meeting again with Lucretia Bott, the ladies decide we're going to call a women's rights convention. They set about writing a notice that appears in a local newspaper, the Seneca County Courier, on July 11th. That's why you can't say the tea meeting took place on July 13th, because the notice is in the Seneca County Courier July 11th, and then it's repeated July 14th.
Preparations need to be made for this convention. Elizabeth Cady Stanton works on a draft document that will become known as the Declaration of Sentiments. She works on a series of 11 resolutions that she wants adopted at the convention. Sunday before the convention, that's Sunday, July 16th, she takes her draft Declaration of Sentiments and the 11 resolutions in draft form to the McClintock House in Waterloo, where she's going to rely especially upon older daughter in the McClintock household, Elizabeth, who had been a school teacher, to go through and make sure that things were well-worded, grammar was correct, and so on. And they worked over the little round table that is shown in this picture. Now, next you're going to see the Wesleyan Chapel as it looks today. It was chosen by the ladies as the meeting site because this congregation typically would allow reform groups to have meetings there in the chapel. The chapel was actually located on the western edge of the business district of Fall Street at the time. The first day of the convention was Wednesday, July 19th. It was a ladies-only gathering that day. The draft declaration of sentiments was presented and reviewed, as were the resolutions. Now, I said it was a ladies-only gathering. One exception. Thomas McClintock, a man, presided over this meeting. On the second day, men could attend, and the res Declaration of Sentiments was formally adopted, as were the 11 resolutions. All of the resolutions were adopted unanimously, except for number nine, the resolution that provided for woman suffrage to be a goal. It was probably only because of the impassioned speech by Frederick Douglass, himself a fugitive slave. In, it was only his speech in support of this suffrage resolution that probably helped to ensure its approval. Now, shown here is the water wall today that is the, at the Women's Rights National Historical Park water flowing over the words of the Declaration of Sentiments, which was modeled by Elizabeth Cady Stanton on the Declaration of Independence. The Thursday evening session uh, took care of some housekeeping matters, such as printing of the Declaration of Sentiments and so on. I've also shown here a picture of the proceedings that were printed. That's at the bottom picture. But in the upper right picture is a plaque honoring in 1908, on the 60th anniversary of the convention, honoring the Declaration of Sentiments as the real milestone in world history that it was. Now, here is an alphabetical listing of the 68 women and the 32 men who signed the Declaration of Sentiments. Technically, women only could sign the Declaration document itself. Men were relegated to signing on a separate piece of paper. There is some significance to the people who signed. Most were local from the Waterloo and Seneca Falls area. Very, very few came from a great distance, such as Frederick Douglass coming from Rochester. Most of the signers were adults. However, Susan Quinn was the youngest signer at age 14, and Catherine Shaw was the oldest signer at age 81. Except for Frederick Douglass, we are not aware of any African American that signed the document. Similarly, we are not aware of any Catholic that signed the document. However, at least one quarter of the signers were Quakers, 
and uh, over half of the signers came from households of the Free Soil Party meetings group. Well, what was the newspaper reaction to this first women's rights convention? Nathan Milliken was the editor of the Seneca County Courier, in which the notice of this meeting had appeared. And he was a signer of the Declaration of Sentiments. And he said it was novel in its character, and the doctrines broached in it are startling to those who are wedded to the present usages and laws of society. He called the resolutions adopted radical. The Rochester Advertiser dismissed the convention as extremely dull and uninteresting. William Lloyd Garrison, in his newspaper publication, The Liberator, he quoted some unknown person who attended the convention as describing it as an erratic, adulpated Come outers group, and that the convention itself was most in, an, a most insane and ludicrous farce. The New York Herald, a New York City pub newspaper, published the entire contents of the Declaration of Sentiments and the resolutions, and thus, free of charge, provided a great deal of publicity for the Women's Rights Convention in Seneca Falls. Some other newspaper coverage included the Albany Mechanics Advocate, which in effect was raising the issue that women were trying to uh, change the division between male and female sexes in our society. Elizabeth Cady Stanton's reaction was that she was almost astonished to see such negatively reported newspaper editorializing. However, there was one significant exception. Horace Greeley of the New York Tribune editorialized that if Americans really believed in the idea that all men are created equal, they must endorse even the right of women to vote. However unwise and mistaken the demand, it is but the assertion of a natural right, and so and such must be conceded. Now, one historian by the name of Timothy Terpstra has actually tried to analyze all of the newspaper editorials of the time that he could a mass. And of the 71 newspapers that he surveyed, he found that 28% of those newspapers gave a neutral, not a negative report, and that 29% of the papers responded favorably. So it's probably safe to say that you can exaggerate the negative reaction to the Seneca Falls Convention. However, the negative reaction was not limited simply to newspapers. Elizabeth Cady Stanton's father rushed by train to Seneca Falls. He wanted to find out if his daughter had really gone insane. Dr. Judith Wellman, in her wonderful book, The Road to Seneca Falls, wrote that the Seneca Falls Convention energized Elizabeth Cady Stanton, that it was a really... Uh, motivating experience. Now, after the Seneca Falls Convention, there were a lot of significant developments that took place in a short period of time. Elizabeth Cady Stanton speaks at various Quaker meetings and continues to be outspokenly advocating women's rights, including suffrage. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and other ladies are sending petitions to the New York State Legislature urging the state legislature to give women in New York the right to vote. On August 2nd, just 
about three weeks after the Seneca Falls Convention, a women's rights convention is held in Rochester, New York. In October of 1848, Emily Collins of South Bristol, a little community at the south end of Canandaigua Lake, is organizing local women in that area into the Women's Equal Rights Union. She writes specifically that the Seneca Falls Convention finally gave her the stimulus to start becoming an activist to work for women's rights, to undo the unequal treatment of women. She will be instrumental in sending petitions to the New York State Legislature for women's suffrage. In April of 1850, a women's rights convention is held in Salem, Ohio. In October of 1850, in Worcester, Massachusetts, the first of several annual women's rights conventions will be held. In Seneca Falls, we have a statue that is called When Anthony Met Stanton, and it highlights the meeting of Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton on a street corner in Seneca Falls on May 12, 1851. Susan B. Anthony had been in Syracuse to attend an anti-slavery convention. She's been temperance in her beliefs, and she's evolving to become anti-slavery. And so her friend, Amelia Jenks Bloomer, invites Susan B. Anthony to come to Seneca Falls and stay with her so that they, together they could go to hear one night at the Presbyterian Church in Seneca Falls. William Lloyd Garrison, the famous American abolitionist speaker, and George Thompson, a famous British anti-slavery speaker, to hear those two speak. And on their way home after that, hearing them speak that night, they encounter or come upon Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who has also heard those two abolitionist speakers. And so Amelia Jenks Bloomer proceeds to introduce Anthony to Stanton. And this statue commemorates that. Now, within a couple of years of their meeting in 1851, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton begin what, it's become, what became perhaps the most famous working collaboration in the entire history of the struggle to secure women's rights. So I hope that you uh, have enjoyed that this program has given you a better understanding of the first Women's Rights Convention held in Seneca Falls in July 1848. Its story is another part of our rich Finger Lakes history.